Yo, hello, hello. Welcome to the elephant in the room. My name is Aaron and in today's video we will continue with the chapter Systems to Organize Societies from the book The Money Game and Beyond. Alright, welcome back. I want to start today's video with an interesting animation that I came across and I'm just gonna share it here. It is basically an animation that puts into perspective the wealth of some people compared to others. For example, this little dot is $1,000. Then this green box is $1 million. And then we have this blue box which is $1 billion. And $1 billion is it's a lot of money. But compared to Jeff Bezos, this is nothing because Jeff Bezos has $185 billion and he's the richest man on planet Earth. And uh, this animation is very interesting because you can scroll and then you can get a feeling of how rich he really is. Jeff is so wealthy that it is quite literally unimaginable. We rarely see wealth inequality represented to scale. This is part of the reasons Americans consistently underestimate the relative wealth of the super rich. Every 10 pixels you scroll is 5 million dollars. <laughs> and I can just recommend you to try it out, to check it out. Here they are kidding, okay we are coming to an end now. But it's just a joke because um, we are about a third of the way. Keep scrolling though, there is more to see. Let's put this wealth in perspective by comparing it to some familiar things. And now this blue box is all the money you will ever earn in your entire life from the day you are born until the day you die, which is about 1.7 million dollars. And this is the annual cost of healthcare for a family of four. So this is the annual pay of an Amazon warehouse worker. And isn't it sad that some people have so much money and they still want to have more because it's just this game that makes them addicted to it. And I would like to say that basically every economics professor who tries to justify this system, this is completely unresponsible. I mean, how can you justify that Jeff Bezos has $185 billion? This is um, not justified at all. On July 20th, 2020, Jeff Bezos made $13 billion in a single day. How can you justify that? Where so many other people are struggling so much, working so much, yet earn very little, maybe a couple hundred dollars or maybe a couple thousand, but never 13 billion in a single day. And I feel like we really have to zoom out. We have to zoom out of our daily lives, of our trade-based society, because we have to understand that Jeff Bezos, like the the wealth of Jeff Bezos is just a symptom of our trade-based society. He became the richest man on planet Earth because he understood that it's just about trade and he founded this huge company Amazon where everything is just about trade but if we really think about going beyond this game then we have to understand that trade is the origin of most problems as we argue from the Trump project and we have to get an educated perspective on planet Earth and just go beyond all these stupid things like getting a lot of wealth, becoming the richest man on planet Earth or having a, a big career or whatever because in the end we are going to harm ourselves. I mean climate change, social inequality, these are problems that are not good for for all of us because it's a problem if someone else is starving to death and I for example get cancer because this guy could have solved cancer maybe if he would have gotten educated if he would have had a good life and did a lot of scientific research then maybe I would not have that problem so you could also argue from an egoistic point of view that we have to overcome this trade-based society but it's not gonna happen because people don't understand that it's all just about trade. Yeah, and then if it comes here to an end of Jeff Bezos with 185 billion dollars, 
then you can <laughs> get a feeling of the 400 richest Americans and they own 3.2 trillion dollars so Jeff Bezos may be insanely rich but it is just a drop in the ocean compared to the combined wealth of his peers the 400 richest Americans own about 3.2 trillion dollars which is more than the bottom 60% of Americans yeah I will put the link into the description and um, also just because it's very interesting and to really showcase that there is no point we can continue doing business as usual or try to do social entrepreneurship or whatever because it's not working and also recently I came across um, a presentation a lecture from Stefan Ramstorff he's one of the world's most famous climate scientists and he had a presentation in Constance and Constance is about one hour from where I grew up from the small village I grew up in and um, yeah I mean he's also just showcasing what the climate science told us and um, yeah that the climate is is heating climate is, is warming up and um, we are going to get into serious troubles and I mean it's already there and um, we will experience more droughts extreme weather all over the world there are several um, tipping points in in our climate system and um, so we really need to change something fundamentally on the way we organize ourselves and this is what I'm going to um, discuss now with the Tron project <laughs> so the little kid is now um, really curious about the other ideas and it understands why it's important to learn about them all before deciding you know it's really important to to know things about the world how we try to organize ourselves so we have to say goodbye to socialism, communism, feudalism, capitalism, totalitarianism and even you, democracy, we do understand that all of you or at least some of you are honest and truly want to provide what you think are sensible ways for organize ourselves but we're going to look at some newer ideas, ones that have emerged from our present day scientific and technological advancements. I heard that the sharing and gift economy sisters have recently arrived at Mars to present their ideas. Technocracy, open source, sharing economy and more are on their way as well. So we want to learn from them too. Alright, so my fellow Martians, the old guy says. Now that our first guests are on their way back to Earth, let's see what the second final group of guests will propose for us to organize our Martian society. We have little time to lose as we need to get things up and running here on Mars and get on with our lives, so let's bring them in. Now the first one is Technocracy. He says, hello Martians, quite a trip here, glad to see you all, let's get down to business. I'm aware of the presenters who were here earlier, but I believe they give far too little attention to technology and how important it is. After all, we all came here on a rocket ship. My proposal is similar to what communism proposed, in a way, to eliminate money and all economic measurements of skills and products, replacing all of that with highly technological people who can make the most intelligent decisions for all. So basically technocracy is about that people should not elect who will decide for them, but rather these decisions should be arrived at based on the skills of people. For example, in case of a heart surgery, you don't elect who is gonna do the heart surgery, but you're going to have a, a decision that you will arrive based on skills that people have. And then of course, if someone is um, knowledgeable enough, then he will do the heart surgery. If one becomes skilled enough by going through the processes of schooling education, then he or she will be a surgeon. So. Who will decide what transportation system we should use? A transportation planner who is highly educated in that area. How to raise children? Highly trained psychologists and perhaps sociologists. The same goes for construction, engineers, food growing, chemists, chefs and so on. 
The society I propose should not have elected leaders like a democracy, but instead skilled people should be the ones deciding for the bits and pieces of society's needs. Many roles, all based on technical skills. We need to use the scientific method to solve social problems, because every single issue has a mechanistic nature to it. That goes for everything, including human societies. It is just a matter of understanding the mechanisms at work and arriving at appropriate decisions. But democratic controls for any non-technical issues and decisions should still be allowed, of course. We first need to conduct a survey of all available resources within a given area to make sure it can sustain the level of production and distribution we'll need. Speaking of that, in order to have an inventory of the resources, energy and what people consume, I propose to measure everything in energy units. So, for example, a certain kind of gadget requires a specific amount of energy to produce. From mining to refinement to production to distribution. So that should dictate the price for that gadget. So the gadget's energy price reflects all the energy that went into the production and distribution of that gadget from raw materials to the final product. And then he continues, now you may be wondering if this is just a new kind of capitalism or money system. It is not. First, this is a direct measure of resources, not an abstraction like money. Second, is the way that we distribute and make use of these energy certificates. We give the same amount of certificates to everyone, black, white, short, tall, female or male, and they are only valid for the individual's personal use, so they can't be shared with anyone else. Plus, these energy credits are recycled after a period of time, so they cannot be accumulated, they cannot be hoard. This way you cannot bribe, gamble, corrupt and so forth. All public services such as local transportation, healthcare, housing, education and our infrastructure and its maintenance will be provided for free without any personal expenditure of energy units. An individual's personal energy units would be used for food, personal effects and entertainment, creative development and expression. And, very importantly, we propose to create an abundance of goods and services and so these energy certificates will mostly be for keeping track of resources and what people buy to know what to produce but not to limit what people can do because they will have enough of these energy credits to access pretty much anything they want. So I hope you get the point. He is trying to propose some kind of energy units that are a kind of measurement for the production of goods and services. And then people um, won't be allowed to accumulate them because these energy credits are recycled after a period of time. That being said, we expect crime will be cut down by a huge degree since people will have access to what they want and there is no human nature. So he really gets the point that human behavior is created by the environment and he says that behavior reflects the environment that each human experiences. People will become more kind with each other, have more free time to pursue creative endeavors and so much more. Our goal is to produce goods of the highest quality possible, focusing on production for use, not production for profit. We act as the technological arm of the people. We don't dictate people's lives, but build what people need. So, scientists instead of politicians, technical skills instead of voting and democracy, and energy certificates acting as a measure of our spendings. All of that should coalesce into an abundance of goods and services encapsulated in a self-sustainable system where we measure resources and energy so as to not exceed what we have available. I think this is an interesting approach as we have to admit that our world is mechanistic, it has a mechanistic structure, you know. Um, if the wind blows, the ship will um, sail. If the plane has no wings, he will not be able to fly. If a car um, has no wheels, it won't be able to drive. So everything has an origin and an effect. And this is also something that people don't get in today's world. Because they think, oh, I have free will, I can decide whatever I want to, whenever I want to. But no, it's your wishes, your dreams, your 
um, reality is created by your environment. So if you see an ad that showcases a Nike f shoe, for example, maybe you want to have a Nike shoe in the future. And yeah, we really have to make this point about the environment that defines us, that reflects us and um, that we have to change in the end, because otherwise we will see the same behavior over and over and over again. Now the sharing and gift economy. They come in and they say, you talk about energy measurements, but today we have the technology to create an abundance of renewable energies where the cost of producing something would be near zero. Zero marginal cost production. So I believe we don't need things like energy certificates anymore. Also, in the same way, we could have an abundance of production that I believe is much better shared, not via a scientific centralized elite group, but decentralized, where each individual becomes a prosumer, both producer and consumer, and not for money or energy credits, since wherever there is abundance, there is no need for currency. People will produce and share, plus consume what others produce for free. That's the basic idea. And now Decentralize comes in and he says, that's what I'm talking about. If you centralize production and distribution, you will inevitably end up like fascism, totalitarianism or authoritarianism and not because of bad intentions or design, but because you would be allowing power to become centralized and eventually controlled by a few elites. Now technocracy responds, nonsense. No one person or group of people can take control of a highly technological society. We want to educate people to be engineers, scientists, to be able to get involved with managing various parts of the society. People will be educated up until the age of 25 and then be allowed to work until 45 when they can retire with the full benefits of the technocrat society for free. Even if someone refuses to participate, he or she will still have access to all of what we offer. But I do have to mention that if you apply my system, I recommend that you only accept your own citizens to be part of it. Avoid opening it up to people from other regions until you get your own region in shape. Military protection will be necessary until all of the surrounding regions become technocratic too. So you still see that technocracy has some weird ideas. And that's also what open source is arguing. Oh man, there we go again. Separating yourself from others. Risking elitism with a centralized plan. Having rules as to how people can work and within what ages. I really expected you to be thinking more openly about this technocracy. And don't come again with top-down plans as to how society should be structured. Because that's the mistake all of the earlier discussed systems made. Here's what I propose to get rid of all these top-down bottom-up ideals and make sure no one gets to become a dictator or otherwise control or stagnate progress. The source of all work and inventions is open, fully shared across society. That's all it needs to progress. That's the only rule. So if you start with a design for a house with some blueprints and you open the design for everyone to build their own house, then you can build upon your original design without losing time and effort creating their own design from scratch. This approach significantly reduces their work as they use an already existing design that they can improve, modify or otherwise adjust however they see fit. By allowing this kind of copying without restrictions, you encourage others to open up their own ideas for new blueprints, designs, source code for software and for those who strive to improve upon them to share their improvements. I am talking about rapid, continuous, incremental updates stimulated by these ideas. So of course it makes sense. If you create something you, from scratch for example, if you start with a new project and then you create something, let's say a software, but then if you open it up for others, if you put the source code available as free to everyone, then they can use that source code and improve it. They can debug things, they can um, make something new out of it, they can fork it. And this is just amazing because that creates a diversity of different things. So this is the idea behind that. 
And then he continues with the example of a house with a solar panel on top of it. Imagine someone taking the open source design for a house and adding a new kind of solar panel model to it to make it more efficient and then open sourcing that design as well. Now we have an open source design for that kind of house and the updates will come along the way from all the people around Mars with no boundaries, no one in control. You see? No one can control that since you made the information of building that house available to all. You will create a huge community of creators, of innovators and improvers while making cooperation the force behind society. The same thing applies for everything. Software that can be improved and made into many flavors to suit many needs. Different interfaces, purposes, compatibilities with hardware. Blueprints for tools that can be used by anyone for whatever purposes. Hardware that anyone can improve and use. For example, make your own smartphone from other people's designs and ideas. 3D printers already work this way, where people from all around the world share their designs and improvements, so anyone can make 3D models of those designs using their own printer that was printed by another printer, all open source. It's all of the cumulative knowledge of all people available to and for all people. So I agree with decentralized, but I add the open source rule to the mix to make it viable. And the sharing and gift economies, they say we cannot be more happy open source. This will accelerate the sharing of stuff between people and improve cooperation. What a brilliant idea. But technocracy is like, okay, how can you be sure that people know how to make these things? Are they experts? What about big projects like dams, transportation, managing Mars resources, doing science? And also for that, um, the open source guy has an answer. Good point, technocracy. The idea of open source is actually the basis of science. It is accepted in science that if you conduct an experiment and present a hypothesis, you have to make all of your observations and details open to the scientific community or else no one will take your experiment as valid as they need all the pieces of your research to test and verify your claim. Science is already based on this open source mythology. I propose to make it mainstream and apply it to everything. Unlike science, where it is crucial to present your work for peer review, other domains like the production of stuff, for example toys, gadgets, recipes and so on, should not force people to open up their work since they will likely do that once they recognize the value that they get from being able to use other people's efforts. So what he's saying here is that if I create something and I don't want to make it open source because maybe I want to make money with it, maybe if I see that other people are doing that, they are putting their work as open source available to other people, then I might be like, well, I can see I can use what they created and I can improve it and then I can also share it with other people so that other people have the the fruits of my improvements so it will be just a logical thing in the future to to open source everything to make things for free because it makes no sense to just keep them for yourself we will continue or we will discuss that point a bit more but first he is continuing with by the way, I hope this way of cooperating and transparency will make those scientific open source studies become more mainstream open as well. Not only open to other science groups, but open to the entire public. You see, this approach of not forcing anyone to open source their work will be an emergent process. It's so good because people are truly free to do whatever they want with such pieces of open source work and they will as the people of Earth are already showing with all kinds of open source projects at the moment. There are hundreds, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of open source projects out there right now. Imagine making all of the patents, inventions and ideas on Earth completely free right now, where you then tell everyone on the planet you can do whatever you want with these ideas, sell them, invent more and share, improve some and keep them private, etc. Do whatever you want, it's up to you. You would quickly see many of them improving, inventing more and then sharing all that mainly for free 
As Earth has shown, there are many more people who prefer to engage in sharing behaviors rather than the opposite. Those who choose not to share their improvements automatically become irrelevant to the procession of continual advancements. Get it? So he's making the point of it will become irrelevant if people say, okay, I want to sell what I, what I created here, I want to make money out of that, because so many more other people will see it is so much more beneficial if we work together, if we improve our designs, our software, whatever, um, because then other people will have the benefit of that and they can improve then as well. So it will be more beneficial for all of us. And he's saying none of this is related at all to one's religion, sex, gender, age, credential, nationality, etc. You just provide tools for all and watch it grow. So I really love this idea because it, it just it, it doesn't tell you what to do. You have the freedom, you have the choice to do whatever you want and you can just improve what people published as open source. You can improve that, take it and um, yeah, help other people with that because other people will benefit from it. But then technocracy is thinking, okay, what about the bridges and roads and resource management and all such projects open source? How are they built and managed using your method? And then open source answers, all right. Well, I'm only talking about the method of making everything open, not to how society should manage such projects or what they should build. I see no difference between what you propose when it comes to such big projects, experts arriving at decisions, and what I propose except that I encourage such projects to be open to the public. So if a group of engineers build a bridge, their work is open sourced for future improvements. When some other engineers need to build a bridge in another part of the world, they will be able to base the design on that previous one to speed up the work and improve upon it. Plus, if a group of evil engineers decide to try to spy on the population for whatever reason or do any other damaging stuff with the technology, anyone can see that when it's open sourced. As this notion of open source gets into people's heads, like the more people understand the benefits of things if they are open source, um, then closed source projects will become increasingly unpopular and will force big projects to open up their work, their blueprints. Because, for example, imagine telling people that they are not allowed to photograph a mountain or some other place in nature because it's not open for that, it's private. That would be quite strange, weird and unacceptable to most people. And open source sees that same thing gradually happening with closed source projects as people discover an inventions, blueprints or a software code or any kind of work, recipe, video, photo, etc is not being shared with the rest of the world for free. And when it comes to experts, many people today on earth do all kinds of important and huge projects in this open source style and are not experts in those fields. For example, they didn't study that but um, and in a an university or whatever, but they kind of do it in their free time and become an expert in 3D printing or whatever. So now it is time for the Virtual History Museum for the last time. And as you can imagine, we will continue here in the next video then. We will see how technocracy was put into practice and if it worked or if it failed. Um, but yeah, I think this part here is one of the most interesting part of the book because it, it discusses very important ideas. It is way more beneficial for us as a, as a society here on this planet to share, to cooperate, to work together, to um, gift other, to other people instead of hoarding stuff for ourselves. But yeah, this is, these are the values that are promoted by our trade-based society and um, we kind of have to overcome that. So yeah, let's see now in the next video how it will continue. We will discuss um, technocracy. There were some interesting projects already a um, couple years ago and let's see what we can learn from them. 
all right that was it for this video i hope you're doing okay stay safe stay healthy and see you then in the next video take care much love